The, the theme of uh, Phyllis's talk tonight is inner guidance. How do we keep in contact with Baba, our higher self? And I think that this topic is very, very important, being in inner contact with Baba, because Meher Baba is not in the body anymore, and even if, he, even if he were, few of us would have the privilege of being able to live with him. Meher Baba's whole path was one of inner contact with his lovers, by people who are attuned with him in their hearts through love for God. Yet, because, it, because we don't have that external guidance that we're so used to in the outer world, and that so many ordinary spiritual paths teach some sort of external thing to do, because we don't have that, and because we must rely upon Meher Baba within ourselves, this topic of how to do that is very important. And we're especially fortunate to have someone with us who has been cultivating that skill with Baba's help for the last 40 years. So would you please join me in welcoming Phyllis Ray. Thank you, John. That was very sweet of you to give a plug to our publication. <laughs> I was thinking uh, today that the very first day I met Baba, which was May 10th, 1952, Baba welcomed me, of course, with this wonderful hug and this wonderful glance, and then he went on to say, I heard about you from Elizabeth, from Margaret, from this one, from that one. And I heard you from within. And that meant a great deal to me because, you know, you speak to Baba inwardly all the time. And I think the question for everyone is, is God listening? Is he really listening? And Baba answered that and showed in many ways through the, through the years, both before I met him and afterwards, that he is just right there. He's just as close as, well, closer than this mic. He's in your heart, and that's where he listens to you. He doesn't have to do any yogi tricks to listen to you from somewhere far away and so forth. And that's the mystery of it all. And that is the solution, because you are one with Baba, so you don't already you have to find out that you are, but it's it's like a, a something you already have. You already are there with Baba, so that is one real reason why real contact with him is possible. <clears throat> Again, Baba said to us one time when we were sitting with him. You know, he just spontaneously threw out these things the way Baba speaks spoke to us then. Um, he said, I don't have to do anything. Everything comes to me. All knowledge comes to me. That, and that's very wonderful to think about. But he, it's just, when you hear the word absolute knowledge, you know, in the prayer, the Parvati God prayer, absolute knowledge, absolute bliss, absolute love, it's like he doesn't have to do anything. It all comes to him. He knows automatically everything. So he is listening. He is hearing. And of course, as you know, the unique thing about the avatar, which is different even from other perfect masters, after they've dropped the body, the other perfect ones have no connection with the creation. And of course, all these muktis, all these liberated ones, have no connection with the creation. Uh, let's say you're praying to St. Joseph, but St. Joseph is long, long gone, <laughs> or whatever, Virgin Mary, and so on. But with Baba, he is always on the direct line. Uh, he's always listening, he's always there, he's always in connection. And this is a very, very important point, which uh, Bao, our recent visitor, brought out so well, that we are in this very special time, particularly of the manifestation, which, if Baba comes back in 700 years, will be 100 years from his dropping the body. Somebody good in arithmetic, <laughs> what is it? You're, 1,000 and something, and 200 years if he comes back in 1,400 years. So we have right now, all of us, a tremendous special link and chance to have direct communication with the Avatar, with God himself. 
And having established that, that's a very important thing. And Baba brought it out especially in this little message, which now Val has continued to elaborate on, about the door which Baba creates and opens, especially in this Advent. I'll just read you Baba's message. The Seven Doors. This is from a Val's new book, Mayor Baba Manifesting. In 1967, before Mayor Baba instructed me to write his biography, and to write about his work, he gave me several points. It was during night watch, and Baba told me to get pen and some paper. Baba began, I am going to give you a few important points about my manifestation. Write each point down. Quote, my abode is infinite. It is formless. But there are seven doors in my abode. Each door remains closed to all those bound in illusion. The aim of involution is to open these seven doors to experience my infinity. The first door is extremely difficult to open. All the kingdoms of evolution stand at the door. Humanity has its back to this door. All faces are turned toward illusion. Humanity is the nearest kingdom to this door. I come to open these seven doors. I work to cut a hole in the first door. That door leads to the first plane. This cutting is my work during my lifetime. And that's this particular lifetime, and then there's this chart of the door and so forth. But the, the most astounding thing is that in this avatar, which Baba has opened that door, which is so difficult to open, and which is the real opening between you and God, for us who are still gross plain, gross human kind. I mean, there may be some saints here, I don't know. <laughs> but for us, that is the first step that we make from the gross plane to, to that first plane. And as Baba explained, we have all through evolution, and uh, that means all through the lower forms and always 84 lakhs of human lives, we've been facing outwards toward illusion. And so we look away from God, who is right there, right with us. So his work is to cut the door so and get our attention to turn around and step up and go in the door. And that is our first step on the path, as Bob explains. But without his opening the door for us, it would be very, very difficult. And other masters do things in other ways, but Baba has done it for all of us. And this is the first fact to know about how to find inner guidance, that Baba has done the major job for us. He has opened this channel or door. I sort of like the word channel, although the word has been rather abused by other people, channelers and so forth. So my point is that Baba has done for us the major job. Now what do we do? Why do we uh, feel sometimes we don't have Baba's inner guidance, or we'd like to hear it more clearly and more definitely, more real uh, ways. And I was very impressed by two things. First, when Val was here, he kept saying, we are ordinary people. Remember that? He kept saying, we are ordinary people. Here's this man, you know, <laughs> this incredible disciple. He says, I'm just an ordinary man. And the other Mandalis say more or less the same thing. They don't claim to be illumined. They don't claim to be yogis or have powers or anything. They are just ordinary people, but they love Baba. And then Kitty made a point. Uh, her talk was on how to develop awareness. We have consciousness, but how do we develop awareness? That is, we might say, polish that consciousness so it really reflects uh, the higher light, the inner light. That was her, her talk. So these two talks sort of blended in my mind that we are ordinary people, but we have, and we have ordinary consciousness. How do we heighten that and work toward uh, getting closer, in closer contact with our inner guide, which is Baba? And the first thing is to realize that what we're trying to get inner contact with is already there, Baba said. I am one with you, I am your higher self, this self that you are searching for, 
or if you want to call it God or the infinite, and the Buddhists call it the void, and this one and that one call it different things, you are reaching toward what you already are. So you don't have to create it, you just have to uncover it. It's like your consciousness is a beautiful mirror, but it's covered with dust. And once you get the dust off, you can look in it and you will see who you really are. That's the goal. So how do we do this? Well, because we're ordinary people, we don't have uh, powers, we're not yogis, we don't do tantric meditations, we don't do all sorts of things, and we shouldn't. <laughs> Uh, by Baba's grace, we don't get into that, hopefully, or if we do, he gets us out of it real fast. <laughs> but we do have a chance to contact him through surrender. Baba says the key is surrender. If you think, what is the one word that will bring you closer to Baba? It is the surrender. He stresses that over and over again. Well, what does that really mean? It means surrender over and over again, as Eric says, we surrender. <laughs> it's not one act that you do and that's it, finish. Uh, not like that Catholic thing, you confess the sin or whatever. <laughs> it has, goes on and on. It's like peeling the onion. And uh, that was a simile that the Buddha used many times. You have to peel the onion. You know when you peel an onion, you keep peeling and peeling and finally there's, there's nothing in the middle. <laughs> uh, that's what you are. You, you peel every layer of samskara is off, and then you are gone. That ego is gone, and you find that you are God. But that stripping off is really tough. Nobody likes it. I mean, I'm speaking for myself. I mean, maybe you like it. <laughs> so, but the, the hopeful thing is it's already there, what you have to find. So, uh, it's not something you go searching for. We think often of the spiritual path as a search, we think of it as a path, and I got into this idea that that's sort of an old-fashioned idea, to think you project out on a path, and in our new thinking in physics, we have, we don't have the straight line of geometry anymore, we have Einstein giving us curved space, inner space, we have the idea of the holograph now, where everything is everything else, and one tiny drop of of an atom is the picture of the whole universe. Did you know that? And uh, so, instead of saying we're going straight on a path to go home, like, actually you have to implode, you have to find it within, circle around it to find it within you. And that's a lot easier. That's what when Eric says, we don't follow the path, the path follows us. You're going really in a circle, and you circle back to your original source, your original godhood. And with Baba's love, you see, you, you don't have to project endless journeys. In fact, he tells you, I'm not taking you through all those planes consciously. I'm shutting the door on it. I won't let you see all that. Just surrender to me, and you'll get there. He, he even talks about the bogey in India, they call it the freight car bogey, or something like that. You get in the bogey and you shut all the doors and you don't know where you're going, but the engine at the head of the train takes you where you're going. So I always think more of Western uh, similes. You get in the elevator at the Empire State Building <laughs> and you shoot right up to the 65th floor. You don't see all those floors in between, but when you get out, what have you? And uh, that's sort of what Bob was going to do. <laughs> so, they're, they're kind of two steps, I think, and this is where I made some notes. Okay. Two steps to getting the contact, that inner contact. The first one uh, is to develop the intellect in the sense that use your mind, use your intelligence, to find out the facts, that's the first step, to develop the head in the sense of studying Baba, studying the cosmic map he's giving you, getting all the facts straight, uh, which means cutting away all the false teachings and ideas by automatically absorbing Baba's ideas that he's given us in the discourses, God's, because he's kind of giving you your position in the universe. If you're an astronomer, 
I say, where am I? I'm on this little planet Earth, and I'm in this small world around this dying star, the sun, and that's in this Milky Way, and, you know, they go on and on. But Baba gives you a map like that. Where are you? You're a human growth conscious being, and you're traveling toward realization. You come through evolution. You know, he gives you all the facts, and it's very important to get that all straight. I feel, because if you come into birth again another place, another time, those facts will be way inside of you, and it will automatically help you, speed you up on your path, because you'll push aside all the kind of false things that will be there. Maybe distorted versions even of Mary Bob, <laughs> you know. But it gives you a clear idea of human progress, of where you are, where we're going, where we came from. It gets the intellectual side clear. I think that's important. And the second thing is, um, and that's why Baba told us to study God speaks ten times, and I'm sure he'd tell you, read the discourses when you met him for the first time. Have you read the discourses? No. I'll read the discourses. <laughs> Send you off <laughs> to read them. In other words, get the cosmic map straight and where you are, just like taking a trip. You take out a big map. Where are you? Then? And the second thing is, to develop the intuition of your heart. Sometimes we forget the first and only want to go to the second. Or we emphasize the first, the learning side, and we forget the heart quality. And that's maybe a little more difficult to develop the heart quality. What is intuition? It's not psychic ability. A lot of people get very confused about that. It's not cities or yogis' powers like predicting tomorrow's headline, or uh, like I did one time, uh, picking all the winners at Hollywood Park. <laughs> uh, you know, stuff like that. Um, it's definitely a different thing. Intuition is developing. <laughs> oh, that's another whole evening. <laughs> but um, it's what you call a real channeling. And you have to... Awaken the heart. Now, Baba said something very beautiful in being. He said, God gives the gift of love for him to his lover, and then he forgets the gift so that he can enjoy that love. That. And this is what Baba's give, given probably to everyone in this room, is planted a seed of love. And the seed can be minute. I don't know if you're a gardener, but some of those seeds are so... Incredible and small, and out of them come such incredible flowers. And that's the seed of love. He has already blown that seed at you. Now you have to let it flower. And uh, he's given you many hints on how to do that. First of all, by concentrating, if you feel that you can't love Baba, and you get to those days sometimes, I don't love Baba. What am I saying? I'm saying, I love you, Baba. Where is it? It's dry, it's empty. But he always encourages you by acting out the love, then the love will come. It's like St. Francis said uh, so beautifully. Someone asked him the same question. He said, well, it's like a dry riverbed, dry soil. You, you, you draw or cut or dig a channel in the dry earth. You dig the channel ahead of time, and then... Someday the water will start to flow. But if you don't have the channel, then where will the water go? And um, so you, even if it's a dry time, you can do the mechanical things are fine with Baba. You say Baba's name over and over. You look at his picture. You, you uh, say the prayers. A few simple things like that are creating a channel because... Words have vibration, even though you may not understand them even. <laughs> um, although we don't have to go back to mumbling Latin, you know. <laughs> but uh, it creates a channel, and it breaks up the patterns of the negative thinking in your head. And so you're creating a channel, and the love will come. I think Dr. Goa's story is so beautiful. When she came to Baba, Baba said, I want you to come and work with me and be with me in the women's ashram. And she said, Bob, I don't love you. And uh, he said, but would you obey me? And she said, yes. And Bob said, fine. 
and she joined in. She said it took her a couple of years before suddenly she felt this love. I don't know whether it was sudden, but the love did come. But she obeyed. Now that's one way you can make the change too. Uh, obedience. Bob always held obedience above love. He really did. So if you, you don't feel in contact with Bob, you might examine what you're doing. Are you really obeying Bob? You see, you're cutting yourself off if you're not obeying Baba, and you're cutting yourself into the channel of love uh, if you do obey him. <laughs> Baba's made pretty clear what he likes about obedience and some of the things he wants you to do. I won't get into that, but obedience is, is creating the channel, very, very deep channel, and disobedience is doing just the opposite, cutting you off from Baba. Even though he's forgiveness, I don't mean that. But it's just that the flow of sincere we're so embedded in sincere that you have to work very hard to, uh, to create a channel for the love to flow through these myavic emotions that you have. And once you get these two things together, you have the intellectual facts of the spiritual background of the universe, and you have Baba to focus on, to create love, and the love for him starts to flow, you begin to feel the real love for the rest of the universe. You know, it's just like when you fall in love with a human being, you know, suddenly you feel very good about other people, too. And that's the wonderful thing. That's why Shakespeare said all the world loves the lover, because the lover is suddenly released from his ego a little bit, and uh, maybe not too much, but uh, he starts feeling nice about everybody. He's much nicer, or she's much nicer person. And the same way we fall in love with Baba, just imagine the more you love Baba, the more you care about everyone else. And um, be, uh, really, because Baba is in everyone. It's just like uh, a moment I had with Baba was, I probably talked about this once before with this woman who had taken a burning dislike to me or anger over something very petty. So Baba said, do you love me? And she said, yes. And then he said, then love me in her. Embrace her. It was very difficult for her. But that's the simple bottom line. If you love Baba, then you love him in everyone. Because he is in everyone, and, and you know, in some mystical state, you'll see Baba's face in everyone, or maybe in that one person you dislike the most, or uh, spies, or whatever. You know, uh, it's not enough just to love Baba, that nice guy in Amanagar, <laughs> or those nice pictures in the picture books, in the films. I mean, he's in every face in this room, he's really here. <laughs> so, if we balance the head and the heart, the love, the intuitive side, and the head side, that's the moment of illumination. Baba said that when the heart and head are absolutely balanced, then you get mukti. It's not when you just get love, and not just when you get the head straightened out. It's just that moment. And I remember Darwin Shaw telling me, how, you know, he always has these wonderful mystical experiences. And Baba gave him this experience one. He felt actually the energy of his head coming down and his heart coming up, and they met right here, and he had this wonderful moment of freedom. It's like there's two parts in us, this left brain or right brain or top brain and heart, have been separated, and when they come together, there's union and there's illumination. It's, you know, maybe an electric light has these two sides, positive and negative. Then the spark jumps between them and you get light. And that's sort of the way we're functioning as a psyche, as a, as a human being. So it, it never does too well to emphasize one against the other. However, most of us need a little more heart quality, don't we? I don't know. I'm speaking to myself. <laughs> but again, Baba emphasizes that the key to gaining more of the love, more of his love, is surrender. And so then we think, what is surrender? Baba isn't here in the body, and we can't run and do what he asks you to do. Phyllis, go get this, or uh, Nancy, go do that. <laughs> you know, so we're kind of left wondering, what do we do? 
um, to surrender. Well, Baba has explained it as really surrendering our attachment to Maya. Again, going back to the first thought about the door, you're facing illusion. You're in love with illusion. You're attracted to all these things in illusion. So what you have to do is just start turning your attention around, away from illusion and toward God. So Bob is giving you a little kick in advance, a little seed of love, but then you have to nurture it. And uh, so he talks a lot about detachment. Detachment and, of course, uh, suffering is one great way to get detached real fast. So uh, you can also get detached from being very happy. Two, you, you again going back to the lover. The lover is totally, totally oblivious. You know, you, you cross the road and get hit by a truck because he's madly in love, not thinking where he's going. But that's pretty unusual. Uh, the main thing is that we need to have detachment. And Baba gave a very good example. First of all, by I feel the way he conducted his work with Westerners, especially. He didn't tell, I can't think of one person that he told to just totally withdraw from life. Uh, he would call you to him, whether here or in India or something, for a short time. You get kind of filled with the love. You get drawn to God. Then he chucked you back into Maya. And he said for today, for our world, that internal renunciation is where it's at. He didn't send you off to a mountaintop. He didn't keep you in the ashram praying and mumbling and stuff. In fact, one man at Adele and I knew uh, was quite a meditator. He's a very nice, charming Jewish man. He was very much into uh, worshiping the ancient one, you know, the Old Testament and stuff. And um, he, Barbara let him come to the ashram. But the ashram in those days, and still to this day, is a very busy place. And he'd uh, be told to grind the corn and wash the lepers or you know, clean latrines, do all this stuff all day long. And finally, poor Sam, he just couldn't take it. He said, Baba, I just can't take it. Send me home. And he wanted to just be quiet and meditate, you know. And uh, one time, he would fall into his little bliss states, you know, which people who meditate, that's what they kind of want. They want this nice sugar cube of, oh, sorry, that's the wrong um, illustration. Uh, but they want a little bliss. And then that's what he'd get, and then Bob would come along and slap him on the fanny, and, you know, bring him out of his little samadhi. He just couldn't take it, which was more like uh, the active life. And that's where Baba throws us into active life. So we have to internally detach. And that might be a little harder to do, because uh, you're not obviously detached. You've got to face crises and things happening every day and boredom every day and you get detached from boredom it's pretty hard so um, you have to uh, learn how to I, I kind of I always see things kind of poetic <laughs> images you know how oil floats on water that's the way your consciousness has to float on top of another consciousness your consciousness of God of Baba the inner thing floats, just let it float on the obvious other consciousness of the world, which you have to maintain. You can't withdraw from that. You can't be an idiot. So uh, you, you have double consciousness, but you let them flow together, not conflict, you know, but just flow. You know, you've seen the pretty pattern of oil floating. And um, so while you go through the ups and downs of Maya, you're just also concentrating inwardly. And uh, that, that's the way I see it, as a way of detaching. And if things get real bad, you can use that split image, that split consciousness. So that too will build a channel. Uh, if you have that consciousness developing more and more, what you can do as you go through life, develop more and more the inner concentration without losing control of where you're at in your daily life, all the things you have to do and face, it gets easier. It really does. It really does. And that's because you're creating this channel. And then Baba gives you these beautiful little gifts now and then. 
a, a feeling of his love. Everybody gets it in a different way. Somebody may feel it through the love of someone else, the caring from someone else, or they might get a dream, maybe even see or hear father they think and so forth. Or some little gift comes, some little thing is straightened out miraculously from Bob always gives me these little things. I just had yesterday, it was just this crazy little thing. I'm walking along and maybe I was feeling kind of lonely and sorry for myself for about five seconds. And all of a sudden popped out of the head of the neighbor a beautiful big red heart floating in the sky and said, I love you. <laughs> I don't know where it came from. <laughs> I said, okay, Bob, okay, Bob, I got the message, yes, you love me, and then it floated off into the sky, you know, I mean, little silly things, I know, but Bob has some very cute ways <laughs> of helping you over the, the potholes in the road, and um, again, I say the path, uh, you don't have to worry about the path with Bob, but Bob kind of emphasizes it. Um, because he opens up like a flower all around you as a path. It, that's why I said again, it's not going this way, it's going around. And you come to the absolute oneness with Baba, the absolute now, instead of then and then, past and future. It's now. And this brings up another question about worrying about the future or worrying about the past. Some people worry helplessly about the past. Do you all worry about your past? No. All right, you're worrying about your future? Yeah. <laughs> Neither one is important. Neither one exists. Uh, both are illusion. The only thing is this very actual second. Well, if you could really be an Einstein, get down to the second of the second, uh, you'd be at the absolute now, which is Bob. And Baba gave us sometimes a glimpse of that, like we were walking with him in Myrtle Beach, and he walked very fast great strides. Suddenly he stopped me, almost knocked him down and over the back of him. And he turned around and he said, this is this way for saying eyes. He said, concentrate on my eyes for one minute. So we all fell absolutely quiet and looked into Baba's eyes. And different people had different experiences. My experience was that I looked in his eyes, it seemed forever, one minute was, you know, and his eyes turned into hundreds and thousands of eyes. And then the whole scene around me, like people in the woods, little bit, broke up into little dots. You know how when your television goes on the blink, all these colored dots, and then they changed to white, and then there was nothing, and I was just about ready to go clunk out of it. And then Donald goes, you know, brought us back. But it was like the whole universe disappeared and uh, just, just became vibrations, you know, they always tell you it's the own sound and the vibrations. Um, but now I can focus on Baba's eyes, bring it back to my mind, those tremendous eyes that he made us focus on. You see, he brought us out more and more away from illusion to reality. That It's all just a lot of dots. You're a bunch of dots, you know. <laughs> you're creating a look, illusion in my head that you're, you're Lois and you're Tim. Because it's all fake. It's just nothing. You're a bunch of dots. And <laughs> the real you <laughs> is me, <laughs> and I'm you. Uh, but we don't see that. You know, the physicists can of tell you that kind of stuff. And that's why they're getting interested in Eastern thought. So, where am I? <laughs> anyway, one time with Baba. Uh, this was again in '52. We were seated with him in the evening, uh, just the women in the women's house. And he said, uh, he looked around the room all the way up. He said, I'm thinking of a number from 1 to 22. <laughs> and uh, is anyone here who can guess it? So everybody tried. And Adele was the last one to speak, and she said, it's 11. And Bob said, yes, it's 11. And I remember how strange his eyes were. You can't read Bob's eyes. You never could read his eyes. But there was sort of a tinge of sadness I felt of something there. Yes, 11. 
And it was just 11 days from then that he had the fatal, an almost fatal accident in medicine. So he was kind of playing a numbers game with us. Oh, 11 is a master number, and a double 11 is 22, which is master's double number. The Hebrew alphabet and a lot of things, I'm not into numerology, but 11 was a very significant number. So I wrote out, Eleven wonderful things about um, how to get inner guidance, and these are eleven things to remember: that God is love, and we also are love. That's what we're made of. Again, you think you're made of flesh. You think you're made of astral junk or uh, <laughs> subtle vibrations. <laughs> Mental chita, they call it in India. No, you made of love. And our goal is love. And our path is love. Our companions are love. I think the, the, really the nice part about Baba are the people you meet on the way. They're really the lovers of God that you meet. You share a real companionship with them. And, um, uh, that's sort of a bonus that you don't expect in the beginning. <laughs> and also the method is love. People would come up to Bob and say, what is your method, sir? What yoga do you teach? You know, the famous phrase Baba said, um, the real yoga is you go. <laughs> he said yoga is not for the West. He said a lot of things like that. So the method Baba uses is love. Margaret Crass used to say, uh, I remember it so vividly when I first heard her say it, she said, first, you know, Baba said, he was, she was comparing him to a doctor, first he floods the area with love, and then he operates. <laughs> and that's just the way Baba used to work with people that came to him. He'd mesmerize, he'd drown you in love, and you're hooked, you're sunk, that's it. <laughs> And then he starts to operate. It's just like the doctor gives you that whiff or something, knocks you out, and then he cuts you up. So, <laughs> Baba's method is love. And his power is love. His power is love. And our prayer is for love. I think of all the prayers that we say, we say a prayer for love, and that if you've studied all these things, St. John of the Cross, where there's, again, 22 ways of prayer, the highest prayer is for love. And you pray God for love for Him. You don't pray for things. You don't pray for uh, even attainment on the path. Nothing. You just pray for love for Him. And uh, so that's the highest prayer. And our measure is that. If you wondered what it was like to be with Baba, and Baba is the judge, you know, it's just like Michelangelo's Last Judgment, you have Christ the judge, you have that wonderful painting, and over here is the dam, and here is the saved, but that's the Bible. But actually, the avatar is the judge and the measure of man, and that judgment is love, because love knows everything about you. You don't have to present your case, you're just sitting there. <laughs> you are his case. Uh, and he judges you automatically by love that knows everything. If every, if someone knows everything about you, and of course it's not possible for one of us, sort of other than me, then he automatically loves you and forgives you and understands you and judges you. And it's a wonderful thing. It's a cleansing bath to be judged by God. It really is. Your weaknesses, you feel like a huge searchlight has been put on you, and you see all these little things about yourself that you never noticed before. <laughs> but it's okay. It's okay, because you feel the love. The light is love, but it does reveal. It reveals you to yourself. And of course, Bob is merciful. He doesn't do too much of it at one blast. That's why people, you know, he has you there for five minutes in a way. You can't really take it. Or uh, in the beginning, he invites you for one day or whatever, what your fate is. 
but very rarely you're invited to just come and the rest of the time. You can't, you can't take it, you can't absorb it. You can't be judged that much all at once. It's too tough. So your experience on the path is love. The highest experience is you have those peak experiences. The psychologists say, call them now peak experiences. That's great. Can be also depth experiences, gutter experiences. <laughs> no. But uh, the, the main experience is love on the path. The difference between one teacher and another, between one girl and another one, uh, you know, I've, I've, before I met Bob, I researched so many and met so many, I've met so many people. I've met disciples and yogis and God knows what. And the qualifying thing about all of them is, do they have the love or don't they? A lot of them were very nice people, advanced in many ways, um, intelligent, helpful people. But how much love do they have? That's where the big gap is between Baba and any other teacher. Uh, of course, the other perfect masters also radiate love, you know, and dispense it in their own way. But Baba's avatar is sort of the universal beloved. You, when you're over there at Amakiti, for example, it's so impressive with all these. Well, I was there when there were 7,000, now there are, I guess, 20,000. Huh? 16,000 this year. Or stumble of life, or whatever. Of uh, incredible differences of background, race, creed, poverty, riches, West, East, everything, religious groups of every kind, all focused on Baba. This is the miracle of love that is the oneness is brought out uh, by focusing on the avatar who is love. He is the beloved of everyone. A man, woman, child, you know, it's just it's the most amazing thing. And the meaning is love. You ask what was the meaning of the universe, and I grew up in an age where there was a lot of skepticism. It was between two world wars. There was Freud, there was Marx, there was this, there was that. Um, Heidegger, I don't know, you're into philosophy. Uh, all sorts of stuff. And Sartre, the meaning was this is life, all that stuff. I, I rebelled against that. I said, I don't believe any of it. I, don't, I think there's a meaning to it all. And after searching, you search for meaning, you'll find love. Or you search for love, you'll find meaning, you'll find the meaning of love. That is the basis of the universe. And that's something we should never forget. We should never despair or feel it's all a rotten, put up job. Or, you know. Well, listen, you listen to read plays and books and poetry of today or yesterday. It's, uh, I would say 90% of it is down, downers. <laughs> Death is the end of everything. And, uh, you know, everyone should be out for the good life. Your goal is to be adjusted. Who wants to be adjusted? You know, let's reach for something higher than just being adjusted to each other. We have to reach for love. That's, that's the real goal. So, the real channeling, the real inner guidance, is this path that we create by focusing on Baba, focusing on what Baba calls the personal aspect of God. Now, there, he does, in the discourse, very carefully explain that the other main path is love for impersonal God. And that's the way the Buddhists go, and uh, the Advaitists, the uh, certain type of Hindu philosophy, the yogis. They don't go toward the personal God at all. And there's some people whose temperament is definitely for that, through many lives. That's, that's where their whole pattern is. I feel, however, Baba has emphasized Prem Yoga, which is the path of love. So, and, and you see in Baba groups, we've been criticized because we're non-brainy and non-this and non-that. That's okay with me. <laughs> because we are emphasizing love. And Baba did emphasize love. As I said, he wants you to study, he wants you to get the grip on the, on the ideas he's presented, which are fantastic. Uh, map of the universe, but he has emphasized them. So I think in these early Mirabara groups, and we're still only, uh, what, how many years since Baba dropped the body? You know, very close to Baba's actual advent, and we're still in the manifestation period. 
love is very, very important, and the intellect is not that important. It'll get, you know, one will start growing over the other, you know, obliterating the other. That's what's happened to Christianity, Buddhism, and all of them. The love aspect kind of fades like a perfume. But while we are here, let's enjoy it. We get a whiff of that person from the Mongolian, uh, from, uh, you know, we're still close to enough to uh, some of the musts. We can still meet Muhammad, who loves Baba. He's not a mental case, is he? He's not a, I mean, he's not an intellect. He's a lover. You can see it in the burning eyes of your head. So we do emphasize the love. And our search for it, I think a great many people come to Baba because of difficulties they have in life. A few came because they were so happy, you know, but most people come to God through difficulties. And uh, I was talking to someone the other day, why the Baba groups, and this is nothing personal about our group, <laughs> but why are we all having such problems, and why are we all, you know, kind of wounded doves? <laughs> A main people, we're not a nice, well-adjusted Baptist congregation. It's because, you know, <laughs> we're among friends, yeah. Uh, because we need Baba, and I think that's wonderful that in our need we have reached toward Him and uh, yearn for Him, come to Him through difficulties. So that's why we have to be patient with each other, that we are people with difficulties, with impaired functioning, a lot of us have had families that uh, impaired childhoods and lack of love and all that kind of stuff. And but this has driven us toward Bob, and I'm uh, personally an example like that. So I think uh, the psychology of coming to Bob is very interesting. Very few people turn to God through happiness. A few do, but I remember this one woman that came to meetings uh, in the arenas apartment in New York years ago, very well-dressed woman. Adele and I used to take the dresses at the door, ask if they wanted to be informed of other meetings and stuff. And she said, oh no, my dear, she said, uh, not in a condescending way, she said, I'm so happy, I have everything, a wonderful husband, a wonderful children, I have everything I need, and, you know, she was healthy and young and gorgeous and, you know, the kind of person you might envy something. And I didn't envy her at all. I felt so sad for her. She said, I don't need Baba. That was the last I saw her with. So you see, there's a lesson in that. And if you want Baba to solve all your worldly problems, that's pretty bad because you'll quit needing him and then you may drop away. <laughs> so he keeps you just like those diet people, they keep you on the edge of starvation. <laughs> So you keep your figure, <laughs> and you're a good runner, you know, you're a good Olympic athlete on the path. Well, this is a little story about Midas. We had a very touching puppet show here last year, Mary Lloyd, a uh, story of Midas, you know, who had, was given, because he was so greedy for gold, and, you know, this teacher gave him the gift of whatever you would touch would turn to gold, and he thought that was just great. And then his daughter came out and ran to him and hugged him and she turned to gold. And that was really sad. So he wanted to reverse the gift. But actually, the Mrs. Midas is really a psychological allegory. Um, like Baba says, the, the, the seeker seeks gold. The disciple becomes gold. And he can turn others into gold. And the master uh, is pure gold. Make anybody turn to gold. That's what Baba actually said to Chodi Baba. Uh, you know, that I will turn you into gold, boy. And he lifted him up to the sixth one. Of course, gold is a symbol for spiritual illumination. And so the gift of Midas was it's a little different from the old fairy tale. It's like if you, if you love God enough, you will not only love God, but you will inspire love for him and others. And, you know, that's true of the Mongoli. They love God so much, they love Baba so much, that they inspire love for him and others. And that's the gift. That's the gift of Midas. 
So what gets in our way, am I running over time? What gets in our way of the channeling and the love are the same scares, what Val is explaining, the unnatural same scare. Uh, that was kind of a weird word to me, that's just too damn natural, excuse my language. Uh, but, uh, you know, the negative side of ourself, which Jung has given us the word of the shadow. We have a shadow side that we don't like to look at and that we project onto other people, onto groups, onto life, onto things. That's what we push away. We don't see the shadow. Shadow always falls to the back of it. But um, if you concentrate on the light, you see the shadow will minimize. You know how at noon you have no shadow. That's because you're standing fully in the full sunlight. So if you fully were conscious of God, you, your, your negative qualities would vanish. But of course, that's the ultimate goal. So. Baba calls it true forgetfulness. There's this beautiful passage, which I'm not going to read because we're kind of late, but in God's speech you can find it. Baba says true happiness is true forgetfulness, and he tells us very carefully that true forgetfulness is not the unconsciousness, it is not being uh, seeking forgetfulness through artificial means like drugs or uh, overindulgence in our senses, addictive behavior, that's the new word for it, and, um, uh, or sleep. You know how when you're unhappy you try to sleep, you take a pill, you uh, go and, you know, dance yourself crazy or whatever. You're trying to forget the unhappy part of your life. But that's not it. True forgetfulness. That's false forgetfulness. The true forgetfulness is when you remember God. That's the way to do it. You remember Baba, you remember God, and that leads you to a true forgetfulness of yourself. It's the self that makes you miserable, so to forget yourself, you know, you all have these wonderful moments when you do manage to forget yourself, maybe doing something for someone else, or loving someone else, or getting very excited about your new baby or something. You have forgotten yourself, and that's your happiness. But imagine having that happiness all the time, where you don't think of yourself at all. That's what God calls true forgetfulness. And to do that, you have to forget yourself, which is the goal, of course. And again, how do we do that? It's, I think this is still significant. The Bible says it's a balance between the head and the heart. You don't totally forget the universe in that sense that you drop it out, but you balance the view you have of it with the view you have from the heart. It's like we turn around to this magic door that Bob has opened, and you look through the door to God, but you still are not totally cut off from the world. So it's a balance, and that's the magic moment. And Bob says something nice here. The forgetfulness of the world, that's the pilgrim. Forgetfulness of the next world is the same. Forgetfulness of self means realization, and forgetfulness of forgetfulness means perfection. So he's really into forgetfulness. I, I want you all to, <laughs> to read that part in God Speaks. It's, it's long, but it's very beautiful, about how you attain this self-forgetfulness. And if you ever wonder what real happiness is, uh, real happiness is not calmness, not content, not adjustment, not ecstasy, not spiritual experiences or worldly experiences. It's true forgetfulness. And maybe you only get one glimpse in your lifetime of it, but it's like a, the rarest perfume or a, a, you know, something that's just so incredible that you yearn for it. And Bob had a magic way, I'm sure he's given you all a little bit of it, of uh, showing you what it can be like. And that's why we're all struggling towards it. So, I'm reading my notes here. Oh, the last bit was, uh, Baba did illustrate this turning around your attention. You see, he said, it's all there. Your God is right in this room. We could realize him in two seconds, one second, one fraction of a second. If we could turn our attention away from Maya and just face inward. 
And he said that one time, and he took uh, this friend of mine, Beryl, had always used to wear a tam, you know, a beret. She borrowed her beret. I don't have a beret here tonight. <laughs> but he said, this is Beryl. And he had the beret. And he said, now Beryl meets a saint. And the saint gives her a little push. And so her attention goes a little bit. He turns the attention a little bit of Beryl inward. And he took one fold of the beret. It's just starting to turn it. Now she meets someone more developed, you know, and so the beret starts to, he starts to turn it inside out, but not quite. Then the girl meets a perfect one. And then he flipped the beret completely inside out, and so now her attention is totally inward, and not, you know, the whole focus has flipped from outward to inward, and that was, that was a very cute thing. And also, the interesting part is when Beryl died, I was sent a telegram. She was my roommate. I was sent a telegram, but she didn't do very often, believe me. If Bob, Beryl has come to me forever. So I felt, I went, I remember back to this time when he grabbed her beret, and I thought, see, he was already, he was already starting to do it, and then he was going to flip it like that. So, and she only heard of all about eight years, so you all have a chance. <laughs> you know, it's not like she was some saint that trudged along and took yoga classes. And, you know, she went to work in the factory every day. And um, so instead of looking out, we look in. And that's the way we get the inner guidance. By surrendering to Baba, concentrating on Baba. And if any of you here are not Baba lovers, then God is just as good, or Jesus, or Buddha, or wrong. But, you know, we bring up the story about the new oatmeal. <laughs> when you're all Baba lovers, I see you by the face. Anyway, Baba was asked, you know, what about these people who are devoted to Jesus? And Baba said, oh, that's just wonderful. Or wrong, or Krishna. And of course, you meet them all over the world. It's very intense. People get very intense about any of the past avatars. And Baba said, it's like the mother who uh, wants to feed her child and goes to the store for oatmeal. Oatmeal's big in India, quite the road. And um, yes, the man has oatmeal. He has a can of oatmeal on the shelf. And he said, that, that's been there six months, but here's the brand new can. Now, what mother wouldn't take the new can, a fresh out can? And that's what Baba meant, you know, that there's more power in the most recent advent of the avatar. His name is more powerful. His picture is there. You know, we have a lot of things that other people don't have. So let's go for the fresh out now. And Jake Bowers, you all.